Have you ever been in a place where you feel like you're in a desert? You feel like there's no spiritual vitality? You feel like God isn't listening? You feel like you keep on doing the same old, same old, same old things over and over again and there's no freshness. And you're starving to death spiritually and you're wondering, where's God? You're going through issues of life and you're asking God to come into your life and to do certain things, but you don't see God moving and you're wondering, am I going to just wander in this wilderness forever? And you look back upon your life and you can start seeing God working. But in the midst of the wilderness, you just wonder where God is. You wonder, is God going to speak to me? And you get frustrated. And sometimes when we get frustrated in the wilderness, we blame God about the wilderness. And we focus more about our issues than we do about the freshness and the wellness of God. See, digging a well in the middle of the wilderness allows us to have refreshing water. I just remember a few years ago, I was in Tanzania. John Bacon and I took a mission trip to Tanzania to Dar Salaam. And we were out in the middle of a village and we met with all the leaders of the village and they were asking um, the, the pastors and, and the missions organization, what can we do for you? And the one thing that they needed more than anything else was a well. They needed fresh water. They would go into a lake or a pond, if you would, where the rainwater came in. And, and it was a well, it was a water, it was a lake, it was a pond. But everything came into that pond and parasites were in that pond. And, and they would become sick because they would drink out of the pond but they need to dig a well to get fresh water. Well, see, what t we would do today is we would call Harp Well, and they would come to your land, and, and they would drill down about 100 feet, and they would find fresh water for you, and they would cap that well. But in Africa and in Jesus' day, they couldn't call a well company. They had to get in and dig the well. They had to see that the water that was beneath the ground was refreshing. So often today, if we were living back in those days, we would say, that's too much work. That's too hard. I want somebody else to do the work. I'm going to wander around in the wilderness and I'm going to be frustrated. I'm not going to be willing to dig the well. And so often in our life today, if you are honest, as I am, we wander in the wilderness starving for fresh water. We live in a time where we get our satisfaction from the culture and the well of life and not from the living well of life. So often we are satisfied with our culture. We're satisfied with starving to death. We're satisfied with just being and doing what we want to do. But Jesus tells us there's something more important than just living a life in a culture. It's having that inner dwelling of the Holy Spirit and that well of life that can come up within us. And not just be satisfied with wandering in the wilderness and starving to death and asking God to replenish us. And when something happens, we get mad at God because God didn't come in in the midst of our time. And we feel like we are, we are struggling, just wandering in the wilderness. Isaiah gave to us a great chapter. And it's Isaiah chapter 12. And I just want to title this, How to Dig a Well and Make Room for God. Sometimes we just have to allow God to work within our life. The rains will come. The storms are going to take place. Calamities will happen. And either we can get closer to God through the calamities, or we're going to rebel against God in the calamities. But sometimes we look at the 
well. And I know that's where I need to dig. But it's hard. It's hard to dig the well. Because you have to get into the ground and you have to work. So today I want to talk to you very simply about in the struggling times of our life, in the wilderness times of our life, how can we dig a well of satisfaction and how God can work within our life? In Isaiah chapter 12, now, my font's about 18 fonts, so I may be turning my page quite a bit, but uh, you, can, you can watch up on the screen. And in that day, you will say, O oh Lord, I will praise you. Though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away, and now you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation, and I will trust and not be afraid. For yea, the Lord is my strength and song. He also became my salvation. Therefore with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And in the day you will say, praise the Lord. Call upon his name and declare his deeds upon the peoples. <coughs> Make mention that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done excellent things. This is known in the whole earth. Cry out and shout, O inhabitants of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in your midst. Therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. If I could put that in terminology that I used last week, it, it, it just should say, uh, quit posting and start praying. Sometimes what we need to do is understand the water of life is not from the acceptance of man. And not for the accolades of what people can say to you. But it's what God wants to do through you. And when God is not done with you, he's saying this. He says, stop doing what you've always done and do something fresh. Do something new. You know, wells are about 100 to about 500 feet deep. Some are shorter than that, but about the average is about 100 feet deep. And as I said earlier, we would call a well company and they would just drill a well. But in the biblical days when they had to dig a well... They had to dig the well. They had to use their manpower. And they had to use their physical strength to dig a well. And when you dig a well, in Genesis chapter 26, Isaac had to dig a well. He found a place that he wanted to grow and live. And he said this, he said, I am going to, well let me read the scripture, right? Genesis chapter 26. So he built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord, and he pitched his tent there, and there Isaacs and his servants dug a well. Let me give you three quick points before we even start. When you have a house, and you find out where you're going to live, or you buy your house, he said he dedicated it to the Lord. When you find a house, when you find out where you're going to live, dedicate your home. Dedicate your family to the Lord. He built an altar. And he said, this is where I'm going to live. So I'm going to put God first. And then he pitched his tent. He found out where he was going to live. He dedicated where he was going to live to the Lord. And then he pitched a tent. And then what he did, he took his servants and himself. And he said, I'm going to dig a well. Because I cannot live here long term unless I have satisfaction. And that satisfaction has to be a living well. Has to be water that gives to me life. So when you find a place where you're going to live, build an altar. Dedicate it to the Lord. He pitched his tent and he dug his well. In other words, he said, I'm sacrificing. I am dedicated. Where I'm living, what I'm going to do is so, so important. So... The first point into how to have satisfaction within your life when you live in the wilderness is choose the ground in which you're going to live. Find out why I'm going to live this way. Sometimes we never choose ground because we're tossed to and fro. And sometimes we know that we're a believer, but we haven't decided that we're going to live for God. And sometimes we haven't chosen the ground in which we're going to live. 
And when we choose where we're going to live or why we're going to live or what the purpose is within our life, then we can be dedicated and steadfast in what we have done. In Psalm chapter 119, verse 30, I have chosen the way of truth. Your judgments I have laid before me. I have chosen. Sometimes we have to choose the ground that we're going to live in. Sometimes we can't allow the things of our past to hinder what God is going to do. In Max Lucado, one of his books, he said he found, he saw a Chinese man. And this Chinese man was struggling with headaches. And he couldn't deal with his headaches. And, and he went to the doctor and back in China, back in the day that they didn't really have the medical technology that he had. And he, he remembered that years before that he was mugged. And uh, he had lacerations on his neck and on his face. And instead of doing x-rays, they just sewed up the lacerations. Well, when this man was about ready to, to, to cash it in because of his headaches, he went to a, a real doctor. And the real doctor did x-rays. And he found out that he had a four-inch blade stuck in the back of his neck between his neck and his skull. And that blade is starting to cause damage. It started to deteriorate causing the headaches and he had to deal with the blade and he had to have surgery to get the blade out before he could stop his headaches and I believe sometimes we have to look deep within the x-rays of our life to find out what it is in our past to keep us from having a future and sometimes it may be anger failures in life sin that we have, a divorce that we went through. Sometimes it's major issues that out of guilt and out of shame that we just do not care what God is going to do because we try to hide from what we went through. And sometimes we have to get to God and choose the ground that we're going to live in and say, I don't care about where I was. I don't care about the wanderings of my life. What I care about is what God can do with me now. When we have x-ray to the soul, it becomes very self-aware that there's things that I have to do. I want to ask you, what are some things in your life? What are some things of your past that maybe you're scared of? Maybe that you don't want to deal with. Maybe you're not willing to become self-aware of. And because of the things of your past, the fear of yesterday, that you're not willing to put the work in today because there's things that are overwhelming to you. In Psalms 119, verse 173, let your hands become my help, for I have chosen your precepts. Let your hand become my help, because I have chosen your precepts. A precept just simply means a general rule intended to regulate behavior or thought. I have chosen your precepts. Which means I have chosen to do what you asked me to do. When we have chosen to be a follower of Christ. I have chosen to do what God has asked me to do. So in order if I do what God wants me to do. Sometimes I have to change what I did. And if I have chosen God's precepts, I have to say, the things of my past are not going to hinder me, but the things of the future I'm going to hold on to because God is going to be with me. We need to ask the Lord to show us where we can concentrate, how we can love. And there's things that we must do, and the first things that we have to do is we have to get a hold of God. When we choose the ground that we're going to live in, we have to pray. We have to seek God's face. It could be because of your home, your family, or church, or ministry, or job. But sometimes we are afraid of one word. I'm afraid of this word. And that word is failure. Anybody afraid of failure? Afraid that the things I've done in the past are going to hinder me from doing the things into the future. And sometimes the fear of failure captivates us so much that we're handcuffed to what God can do to us into the future. And what we have to do is we cannot be caught in the fear of failure. Failure is the big reason we don't start the groundwork. The refusal to fail guarantees one will never be successful. The fear of failure is more crippling than failure itself. Those who accomplish great things view failure as feedback and not the end. 
I've used this illustration many times, and I was reminded of this this week, of John Maxwell's book, Failing Forward. How many of you guys have ever failed at something? Just raise your hand. So failure is not new, is it? Failure is something that we have to deal with. What do we do when we fail at something? Maxwell says, learn from it. Learn from it. Don't act like it does not exist. But embrace what we have failed and say, I am not going to be limited in what I have failed at. I'm going to learn of my failure and grow from it. Because we all know Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth used to hold the, the record uh, for 714 home runs. And we can all remember Babe Ruth. But do you remember his strikeout total? 1,330. He may have hit 714 home runs, but he struck out a whole lot more than he hit a home run. Babe Ruth could have looked at his failures and say, I can't hit because I strike out. But we remember Babe Ruth as one of the greatest home run hitters of all of Major League Baseball. How often do we miss what God has in store for us because we look at our failures instead of look at what God can do through us. Give God a try. We tell this to kids. What do you have to lose? If you don't like him, the devil will surely take you back. When we look at what God can do for us, give God a try. We have lived for the devil. We've lived for our flesh. We live for ourselves so often. But when we give God a try and say, I am going to move forward for God, never give up. Always remember that he loves us. And the second thing is prepare for the work ahead. You know, we have to understand where the ground is and who I'm going to live for. And then we have to prepare. Preparing is something hard. Prepare for what God can do with us and through us. Sometimes we go to church on Sunday morning and we think that is our Christian duty. We think that as long as I go to church, as long as I listen to the sermon, as long as I sing a couple songs, I've punched my time clock of Christianity. But we haven't prepared for what God really wants within our life. See, I truly believe if we walk in the desert and we need fresh water, we have to prepare way beforehand. Because sometimes we get so disillusioned in our Christian walk because the sermon wasn't what I needed or the songs were too long. I didn't really enjoy church. So Christianity is not genuine to me because I didn't really like something. Well, Christianity is not what Bruce Thomas gives to you on Sunday morning. It's not what Justin sings and the praise team worships with. Christianity is so much more than that. Christianity is an everyday preparation for what God can do within our life. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See, God prepared you not to come to church. God prepared you for something greater than to coming to church. We come to church for the pep rally. We come to church to learn. But Christianity is not between these doors. Christianity is our life. And we have to prepare beforehand before God can do great things within us. Most of us get tripped up because of the mundane, the endless series of pettiness, what takes place within our life, and we get caught up and tripped up because of sin, because of somebody not liking us or somebody not liking something that we say or do. God even removed his hand of control over everything that we've done. And he said this, I want to give to you a free will. God could have said, I want every person to worship me. But he says, no. I don't want to make you worship me. I don't want to make you serve me. I want you to make a choice to serve me. If I make you do something, it makes no difference to me. But when you do something on your own, when I, when I was... When we were younger and I had uh, a couple boys at the house, um, when I told them to mow the yard, oh, all right, I'll mow the yard. But you know, when I came home and the yard was mowed and I quit asking them, whoa, 
you actually did something on your own. It meant something to me because they took initiative instead of being told what to do. They did something on their own. And I believe that's what God is telling us in our volitional will. I want you to worship me. I want you to serve me. I'm not going to make you serve me. I'm not going to love you anymore. Or I love you any less if you don't. But it brings a smile to my face when you do. Philippians chapter 2 verse 13. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. When we serve, I believe there's something that we need to think about. I believe when we serve God and out of the desperate times of our life and we say, you know what, I'm going to choose where I'm going to serve and I'm going to do what God wants me to do and I'm going to prepare my heart and I'm going to do what God wants me to do, I believe it puts a smile on God's face. I believe the spirit within you changes everything about our life. But after we have chosen the ground and after we have prepared, there's times that we have to start digging. Start digging. Spiritually, this is tough. Spiritually, if I would be honest with you and with the people I've talked to, start digging for most of us is quitting doing certain things within our life. It's starting a habitual act of going to church. It's allowing other people to do things for us. But it's not about calling Harp Well to dig the well within our life. It's about getting into the well. It's about getting our life spiritually and saying, there's things I need to do to dig my spiritual well in order to be satisfied. And so often we are not satisfied because we're not willing to sacrifice. So I listed a few things here that we need to do to start digging. Number one, we need to start praying. We do things on our own and we get burned out because we live in the flesh and we work in the flesh and God does not work through us. But when we ask God to do things through us through prayer, when when calamities take place, you know, it's easy for you to pray for somebody else. When somebody else is having a major issue within your life or within their life, it's easy to sit down and say a prayer for Pastor Bruce or say a prayer for somebody that's struggling. But you know what God really wants? He wants you to sacrifice for yourself. And He wants you to pray that you will have the strength. Dedicate a time of prayer each day. See, prayer is just conversation with God. And if you want God to work within your life in the, in the dry times, maybe we have to look at our own self and maybe we're wandering around in the wilderness of desperation and dryness, not because God is not there, is that we just don't seek God where we are. God is beside us. And sometimes we just need to make a sacrifice of dedication of saying, I'm going to pray daily. When I was a youth pastor, we talked about things that we struggle with. And you know the two major things that our teenagers struggle with, and I'm sure if our teenagers struggle with it, the parents struggle with it, is prayer and reading the Bible. We can act like we do. But we have so many resources at our disposal that when we just ask God and say, God, I need you, God gives to us a desire and a purpose within our hearts. Dedicate a time of prayer. 1 John chapter 5 verse 14. Now this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will. He hears us. See not if we ask anything he's going to give to us. But if we ask anything according to what? His will. We have to, ask, we have to know what his will is for our life. And that's our precepts. That I'm going to live under what God wants for us. If I live within his precepts according to his will. He's going to give to us freely what we need. And then put God's word in your heart. Put God's word in your heart. And that's not just coming to church. You know, I, I'm, I'm an old man now. But yeah, sometimes I have a hard time remembering what I talked about two weeks ago. Anybody say amen? You have a hard time remembering what I said at 2 o'clock. But, you know, two weeks ago, it's kind of hard to remember what we prayed about or what we talked about. But when the Bible says, 
put God's word in your heart. It's, it's, it's listening to the word. And in our society today, in our church today for sure, we have resources that you can baptize yourself into God's word. Right now, media is a wonderful tool that we give to every person within the church, absolutely free to you. That I tell you, 15 minutes a day, when you get up or when you go to bed, you can pull up sermons, outlines, messages, challenges, books, and videos that can challenge you like you've never been challenged before. But what we have to do is we have to say, I'm going to do this. Because if we're not willing to pray and we're not willing to put God's word in our heart, do you know what we're doing? We're wandering in the wilderness of desperation. And in that wilderness of desperation, cause a structure. Begin the sanctification process by putting God's word in your heart. Read it, believe it, and study it. Memorize it, think on it. But the most important thing is obey it. See, we can put things in our head and we can read things. And it could be very good illustrations and good processes for our life. But the most important thing is, is God's word is truth. And it's not something that we read for entertainment. It's something that we read to change our lives. And if we just have it in our heads, but we don't obey it in our life, it's just a good fictional book. But when we obey it and understand that God's word is real, it changes our life. It does what God wants us to do. And then actively serve him. As we said just last Sunday, sometimes we have to sit at Jesus' feet and then we can serve him. But if we're not willing to serve him, we have really not learned from him. Start actively serving God to give your talent and to give your ability so he can use you. So often we look at our abilities and what we're good at and I, we take it to work or we take it to school and we give and we serve others. But you know what God wants more than anything else is for you to love him and to serve him. To serve him means put myself second and God first. Jeremiah 7, 23. But this is what I've commanded them, obey. Obey my voice and I will be your God. And you shall be my people and walk in all the ways I've commanded you that it may be well with you. Walk in all the ways that he's commanded and he will be with you. When we dig the well, it takes some work. And then we need to persevere when we keep on digging. So sometimes we have this epiphia moment. Sometimes we have a life-changing event. And sometimes we're walking in the wilderness and we get frustrated and we say, okay, Lord, I'll do it. I'll start serving you. I'll start going to church. I'll start reading the Bible. And we do that for a month. We do it for a couple months. But something happens. A distraction takes place. Things happen. And we say, you know what? I've got more important things to do. In order for us to dig the well, we have to persevere when we're keeping digging the well. Persevere means it's not going to happen overnight. We're not going to have the magic pill given to you by the pastor to say you're going to be spiritually whole and everything's going to be wonderful. It means sometimes it's hard. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5-6, through 6, But also this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to your virtue knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness. I believe one of the things that we must do is we must have the ability to persevere. In other words, when things are not going your way, when you feel like that you're walking in the wilderness of desperation, stay on the path. Keep strong. Never give up. Keep asking. Keep seeking. Keep knocking on God's heart. And God will do great things for you. In Luke chapter 11 verse 9. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it will be opened unto you. Not only for our salvation, but for our journey in life. 
Remember, we have two choices that we have to make on a crossroads. We can choose to believe what we cannot overcome in our situation. Or we can choose to believe that God can overcome any situation. And when we choose that God can overcome any situation, it changes the way that we see God. Sometimes we look at God and we say God is somebody that we just have to come to church. And we have to do certain things. We have to obey Him. We have to read the Bible. But we need to change the difference between have to's and get to's. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to trust in God. I don't have to serve Him. I get to. Not because I'm obligated to. It's because of what He has done for me. I like what Paul said. I press toward the goal, the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I press towards. I move on. I know that God loves me and He's going to take care of me in every step of the way. But when the rubber hits the road, the last point is very difficult. We need to focus on the water and not on the dirt. Did you see that well when they were digging the well? They were filthy. They had to get in and they had to work. And sometimes in our spiritual life, you would think that God should show up and everything should feel like it's an utopia and God is in the midst of your life and God is answering prayers left and right. But sometimes it's work. And sometimes we have to deal with the dirt. And sometimes we get so focused on the work and the dirt, we don't focus on the outcome. And the outcome is God's blessing within our life. We need God's blessing. I want God's blessing. But so often, because it's hard, we quit because of the work. God is just saying this. If you're wandering in the wilderness, you decided where you're going to live, seek me first. I want you to put an altar of God within your life and let God start working within your life and pitch your tent and know exactly why you're serving him. Not because of calamities and not because everything's wonderful. It's because I have chosen the precepts of God and I'm going to serve after him. And then after you've prayed unto God and after you've put your tent where it needs to be, roll up your sleeves and start digging your well. Because the well that you live, the well that you dig gives you water to live. And if we're not willing to live under God, we can live with the waters of this world and we can be satisfied for a very short time for things that we can get from our culture, but it does not give us soul satisfaction. The joy of our salvation is not this culture. The joy of our salvation is what Jesus can give to us. Jeremiah 29, 13, and you'll seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. When you search for God, when, it, when, you just, when it's not search, it means God's missing. It means I plea unto God, Lord, I need you. When your calamity comes, when your failure comes, when your issue comes right in your face, the Bible says, search. In other words, ask, Lord, I need you. I can't do this on my own. And when I try to do it on my own, I fail. Because I'm focused more on the dirt than I am on the water. I need to know that I got to dig. When you're raising your kids, it's not easy. It's not easy, but they need to see you digging. They need to see the calamities. They need to see the desert time. And you need to be honest with them. But you need to also let them see you dig. In Isaiah chapter 43 verse 4. Since you are precious in my sight. You have been honored. And I have loved you. Therefore I will give men for you. And people for your life. When your kids see you. They're going to follow after you. When digging a well. There's a lot of dirt that we need to encounter. But before we reach the water, we cannot get disillusioned because of the dirt, because of the life. Remember, nothing is too difficult for God. 
And he has given us a vision to be fulfilled. And the vision is true joy in our salvation. Joy in our salvation changes everything. Finally, ask God and remember that God is love. When we deliver what God has given to us, a couple things that will represent our life. A well represents provision and life for you and for others. A provision of life for you. When you're in a plane and uh, they're taking off, the stewardess will come up and say that if the oxygen mask come down, put the oxygen mask on yourself. And then if you have a child, put the oxygen mask on them. And you would think, well, that's selfish. Why would I not put the oxygen mask on my child and then on myself? But the bottom line is this. If you can't take care of yourself, you can't take care of your kids. And our spiritual life is the same way. If we're not willing to dig, and if we're not willing to grow, and if we're not willing to allow God to work within our life, our kids and our grandkids will not see the refreshing well of salvation within our life. Monkey see, monkey do. They're going to emulate you. So in my life and in your life, we can't get distracted because of the dirt. We have to always focus on the water that's underneath the dirt. And in the wilderness times, in the wandering that we have, in the struggles that we go through, you have to make a decision. Am I truly a wanderer? Or am I truly a child of God? And if I'm a child of God, and I find myself wandering in the wilderness, I have to say, no more. I have to say, it's a time to stop. I have to say, I can't play the game any longer. If I'm a child of God and I'm wandering the wilderness, I am going to put down my roots. I'm going to find a place where I can serve Him. I'm going to find a precept that I can obey by Him. I'm going to dedicate my home, my life, and my family to God. And then I'm going to pitch my tent. I know where I'm going to live and I'm going to serve Him within my life. And then after I've pitched my tent, I'm going to roll up my sleeves. I'm going to start working. And I'm going to dig a well of salvation. A well of sanctification. A well of salvation within my life. That I know that I'm going to live here. I'm not going to allow this world to determine my outcome. Sure, I may fail. Sure, I'm a dad and I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to say things, do things, and act ways that I shouldn't have acted. But I'm not going to allow my failures to determine what God can do through me. I'm going to dig the well and not focus on the dirt. And once that well comes up, that well of fresh water, it doesn't start sometimes fresh. Sometimes that dirt comes out of that water, and that water that springs up is dirty, filthy water. But you have to clean that water by allowing the water to flow. Allowing the water to flow. And after a few minutes or a day, that water that comes out of that well is fresh. We have to make a decision. I have to make a decision. I can go the easy route. And I can go to the pond where the rainwater came off the mountains with all the disease and all the bacteria and all the parasites. And I can dig and I can pull water out of the pond. And I can take that pond water and give it to my kids. And I can say, refresh yourself. And they may refresh their thirst, but it causes more damage within their life. Or I can say this. I'm going to roll up my sleeves. And I'm going to dig a well that's fresh. That's deep. That's God-fearing. And it may take some work. I may make a lot of mistakes. 
But when I get deep into the water and it comes out, it will be refreshing. And I can give to my family, I can give to myself water that can change my life. Either I'm going to live for this world and be satisfied with the things of this world or I'm going to say no more. Sin is not going to rule my life. I'm going to dig deep and it's work. It's going to get hard. It's going to be frustrating. But the reward is fresh living water. The Bible says the joy of the living water. It may be hard. But once you look back at what God has done for you. And through you through the desert time. You can look back and say. I see God's hand. I look and I see what God has done for me. Was it easy? No I'll, I'll be the first to tell you the Christian life is not easy. But the Christian life is very rewarding. And the outcome is phenomenal. So we can't get focused on the dirt. We can't get focused on the work. We have to get focused on the water. The replenished water. The fresh water that God wants to give to you. So the challenge today. What do you focus on? Do you focus on the dirt? Do you focus on your failures? Do you focus on the work? Are you satisfied wandering in the wilderness in sin and getting your refreshment from the things of this world? Or do we want to take what Isaiah said and say the joy of my salvation is the well of Jesus Christ? If you're struggling, if you're frustrated, if you feel like your life is wandering in a circle and you don't feel that like God has done great things within your life, I challenge you. To know where you're growing. To put an altar where God is. And to pitch your tent. Understand the precepts that you're going to live on. And I'm going to follow after God. And once I've determined what I'm going to do. Once I know I am not going to live in this world. I'm going to be a light within this world. I'm going to start digging. Because I know that if I don't dig a well of salvation. A well of sanctification. A well of satisfaction. It's going to be very easy for me to get so focused on the dirt. I'm going to say no to the things of God. And I'm going to go back to the things of this world. For my easy satisfaction. It takes work to dig the well. It takes perseverance to dig a well. And if we're not willing. If we're not willing to sacrifice. The outcome is overwhelming. You may be saved. But you're not joyful. You may be satisfied in your life. But you're not satisfying God within your life. So where's the dirt within your life? Where's the failure that you held on to? Where's that four inch knife dug within your skull. That's causing you pain. That you need to find that x-ray and say no more. Am I going to allow my past to hinder my future? I'm going to do the x-ray. I'm going to figure out my problem and I'm going to get to the x-ray of God and allow God to change me, forgive me, and challenge me to stand firm to know that I'm a child of God. I can't live my life from the past. I'm going to live my life in the well of the salvation and the joy of Jesus. If you're struggling, if you're in a time of desert time and you really don't have peace, Ask God. Ask God to forgive you. And I challenge you. Do not let the failures of your past to determine the elevation of your future. Because so often God wants to do so much through us that we're just not willing to dig down to the joy of Jesus. And we live in the failures and the defeat and the discouragement and we live there and we're happy there because that's all we know and the Bible says the well of Jesus Christ can give us joy give us peace and to give us satisfaction if you're struggling if you're hurting spiritually 
If you're not happy where you are spiritually, I'm going to ask you to come and ask God to give to you the ability to dig your well, to start fresh. Oh, if you want the easy way, this is not the easy way. This is not the easy way. Following after Christ is hard. It takes work. But the reward, unbelievable. The blessing and the joy and the peace of God is wonderful. But you have to say no to the sin, no to the failure, and yes to Jesus.